like would love to hop on a phone call with you and that's yeah. how i've gotten most of my discussions with agents thus far so now uh, just a question, question for you in regards to all of that too because like do you kind of like research first like okay this is a league that kind of fits what I'm doing, you know, like I think I could really do well in this league and then look at the clubs that kind of have a need in that league and then go, Oh, who are, who represent these players? Like go on Y scout and like find out who represents these goalkeepers in this league or whatever, and then reach out to them and be like, Hey, you know what? I see this team might have a need, blah, 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 blah. Like you can tell yourself that way. I have not done that yet, but I'm definitely doing that when I get home this evening. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I so, came up with something. I, I like it. No, I mean, cause honestly, um, the other thing is too, like I, I didn't even know that there was like a directory like that, but I mean, um, when it comes to finding representation, again, if people aren't like knocking down your door, like it's been a lot of me and my, my other teammates have had similar experiences from what I've heard, like going out and just trying to find whatever's available because there's not, you don't get a lot of information when your senior year's done and you're like, oh, well, I want to go pro. And then it's like, well, I just got to well, kind of figure it out. See you later. <laughs> yeah. yeah like, <laughs> have fun figuring that out. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, um, having guidance like that is, is great. And that's definitely something that I'm going to start doing there now. Go. There you go. What about showcases like in combines? Like, what are your thoughts on that? You know, um, because I know that's I've like a business a now. People get paid to like put these showcases on. I've heard of a couple. Um, I get a little, and maybe this is like bias from, uh, <laughs> maybe this is bias from like my high school days and recruiting. I get a little wary of stuff uh, sometimes, especially if it's like overseas and uh, you know, maybe that it's, maybe that it's a money grab or that's not legit. But I think that, you know, I mean, that's how I got recruited to college was going to camps and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I was again in a similar position where I wasn't having people just like, knocked down my door so i had to put myself in front of coaches a lot so i think that you know if it's legit i think it could be a really really good opportunity yeah um, i think the i think the key with that and especially on the college side of that the key is to see you know so many people have like you know those combines if that's what you want to call it but look at who's there like 100%. legitimately look because they'll give you a list of what college coaches are the coaches that are coaching or that you know they're saying are going to be there because you know if you go overseas or if you go somewhere and none of the coaches that you are the schools that you want to be at or the teams that you want to be that are there, then it's, you know, then it's a it is a money game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. You know? For sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think, you know, one of the things with, with all of that, with the combines is also, it's like what you, you make of it, what you make of it. Cause I think a lot of players, especially in the youth game and you know, obviously, you know, well, I know we're talking about the pro game right now, but just can circling back to kind of youth combines, a lot of youth players go like, I don't know. I went to this, our parents will go like, oh, they, we paid for this college showcase this weekend. Nothing happened. Why well, didn't you get any letters? Like, what's the deal? Well, I think the thing, the one thing is, is I think, I think it is important for goalkeepers to go to the to camps, to combines, to show. 100%. Because you cannot count on, like, showing on your ECNL team no. at, at, like, at, like, at, like, an, at a tournament where, you know, the coach is only there. They're only going to see, what if you don't touch the ball the whole game? 100%. What, you know, what if you don't, what if none of that happens? So get yourself in front of the coaches, whether it's at their camps, whether it's whatever it's at, get yourself in front of the coaches that you, that the schools you want to see. Now it's different in the pro game. Right. You know, so yeah. totally, you know, and, and, and I guess, you know, you're, you're also talking about when you're talking about the pro game, you know, mommy and daddy aren't involved in this process or at least they sh maybe well, sh well hold on <laughs> okay. I'm like, we have to make the joke it just went out there but well it depends yeah. <laughs> hopefully your mom and dad leave you alone and they're not involved yeah, for sure anymore right yeah, I'm, 20, I'm 24 years old i should be able to do it myself but um, and you know i love you out there but oh, mom and dad love you dearly but yeah. i do have to start doing things for myself at some point <laughs> So, I, I will say this. Like, yeah, sweetheart, do you want me to call the coach at Manchester no. United? Mm -mm. I'll talk to him. No, thanks. <laughs> it's all good, Mom. So, you know, Liv, you just brought up a really good point. And Sus, you know, this is this is so true. This is a kind of an uncharted territory when it comes to college seniors. Liv is 24 years old. She's yeah. a young woman. This is a different environment now where these seniors are coming out and they've, they've, they're already grown people. As opposed to you know twenty two yeah. years old, well yeah, you know, coming I mean, out. obviously with the COVID years and everything, people getting more like we have older se seniors or grad or, or grad. so now you have older players going into to go play pro with more experience and and which is great, but you are an adult and 
I, which is terrifying. If you were going into the workforce, like the normal workforce, yeah. your mom and dad wouldn't be like helping you making calls. Yeah. Through the so, whole thing. Yeah. For sure. And I mean, obviously that's not to say like they they're so supportive and do whatever it is that I I ask them to do, but it is it is a I'm I'm at a point in my life for sure. Like I have a master's degree now, which is again terrifying. <laughs> Shout out COVID because that that gave me time to get my master's degree. But uh, when are we have like, so do very soon doctor? Yeah, doctor right. goalkeeper, right? <laughs> doctor goalkeeper, that's great. Like that. <laughs> oh my god. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, goalkeeper yeah. MD. Goalkeeper. Uh, there it is. That's it. There you go. Uh, <laughs> GK MD. Um, Yes. That's a new series coming out. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, there I we love go. it. We just did something. That should be on the CW. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, and I mean, honestly, just on a personal level too. I mean, from a from a logistical standpoint, it makes sense for me to be doing a lot of it myself. But on a personal level, like it feels it feels good to be in a place where I can be making these de de decisions for myself and feel like I'm more independent. And like you're saying, like if I was going into the, the normal workforce, it my parents would not be involved in every job search opportunity that i was having and unless um, it was for the u.s national right but I, but I think a good point is to show a decision that you made was to, to get a one-way ticket to new jersey yeah and be here and say this is where i have to be a lot of parents would be like no honey come stay at home and right. you get a goalkeeper trainer and no <laughs> i'm an adult i need to put myself in the best right possible situation and training environment for me well, whether that was jersey or whether that's somewhere else in the world it is what it is and as right. an adult those are the decisions you have to make 100 percent. i actually had that happen to me years back actually when i was running la goalkeeping academy is i got an email from a parent oh, no. about yeah about their about their kid you know and wanting to work with them i said they played a pretty good level you know and then they i'm not going to say the name of the college i'm going to say the name of the kid but let's just say it was division one school okay. and they're preparing for professional combines and i'm like so why are what, you your this is like a you're why are you emailing me this is like what <laughs> people do for like their eight-year-olds like, yeah. yeah i was gonna say even in like college <laughs> recruiting you should not be doing the email i know like did like he ask his mom to find a goalkeeper coach in the area like it's not insane. <laughs> or did the mom do that on her own like, again, did she and, and for a coach and somebody like that like as a pro coach I mean, I, w I think we're over, but like, yeah. I don't think parents are really that involved in everything like I that. I think, but for a pro coach, you're going to be like, what am I getting myself into? Right mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like 100%. you want to see independent minds, independent thinkers, people that can adapt yeah. and know the right environment, the right thing for them and, and thrive in it. And those are individual decisions. Yeah. 100%. So, so Scott, I have a question for you and maybe this will be good advice for a live, live or maybe she's already ta taken this right now, but. <laughs> You know, obviously, you've been in the collegiate environment. You've been in the professional environment. Hey, Jeff. What's up, man? What's going on, brother? How you doing? Good, good, good. Just uh, making sure that you uh, you can hear me all right right here. All good. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, all right. We're going to start in a couple minutes right here. Uh, I got the I got all the content that you, uh, that you sent me. Um, so I was able to quickly put together a little PDF uh, so we can kind of scroll through all that stuff and just kind of use it whenever we want. Perfect. My bad, man. It, it took too long to get to you. I have like my plate. I've had, I've never had a fuller plate. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, dude, you have no idea. Was this you show at no the, uh, the Philly? Was that in Philadelphia? Yeah. Okay, cool. How was that? It was great, dude. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty solid. We, uh, we had a good time there. I mean, uh, like Suskia now works for CBS Paramount. She's one of okay. their on-air talents now. So um, she was very busy there because, you know, they had the draft. Um, and uh, and so I was kind of just flying solo there, just kind of running around. Um, and Omar's fun, focusing fun, on just fun, coaching fun in MLS. Though, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, dude. And the food there is amazing. It was like it was it was a good time, dude. I, nice. I had a fun time. I had a fun time there. Um, all right. We will uh, we will get this. uh Started by the way, you pronounce your last name properly, Atanella, right? Nailed it. Okay, sweet. One of the Love few. It. Okay, all right. Let's uh let's get this uh going. Here we go.
Welcome to Inside the 18. I'm Michael Majid, live from Hollywood, California. With me, no Suskia Weber, no Omar Zini, because they're big-timing me. They got too much stuff going on. Omar's at preseason with LAFC. Suskia is uh, is a big time on the television now, uh, but that's okay uh, because we found somebody else that's that's got nothing else to do at three thirty in the afternoon Eastern time. Uh, the one and only former MLS goalkeeper himself, and now uh, broadcasting extraordinaire, and I believe burgeoning coach too, Jeff Adanella. What's up, dude? Oh man, I appreciate you having me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you know your guest wasn't good enough to get the others to join along. <laughs> that, you know they couldn't. They couldn't put away what they were doing today to join us. But I appreciate you having me on, man. I really do. I mean, dude, honestly, you know, like one of the really cool things about this is that uh, we had you on a couple years back. Uh, obviously, you were going through some struggles when it came to um, you know some injuries at the end of your career and everything like that. But you, you still. You put a really positive spin on it because like while you were going through all of that, you started approaching these other areas because you kind of saw that there were going to be there was going to be a point in time where you were going to have to hang up the gloves. Yeah, so I was I was very proactive in my time where I was injured. I think the first time around uh, for people that don't know, just like a quick catch up. I, I had to get shoulder surgery, uh, you know, about midway through my career. And then my career actually ended with an injury. Uh, I, I tore something that it keeps your hip to your quad, which is apparently is very important. Um, but, you know, I, re- I really, really learned during the second injury that using that time to be proactive, because if you're sitting at home kind of dwelling on the injury, thinking about, you know, there's a lot of what could have been. I was on the field. I was playing. I was I was feeling healthy. You know, I was feeling like I was going to get a good run of games. Then I get that injury. There's a lot of that. What if what could have been type of uh, type of sentiment and type of feeling. But I learned from that first injury to really be proactive and start kind of seeing what else is out there in the world outside outside of the uh, soccer field. So one of the really cool things that you did is that you you went outside of the uh, the soccer bubble. You know, a lot of people out there when it comes to soccer, like they go like, well, if I'm going to if I'm going to do anything, it's going to be soccer related. You're like, not hockey. I'm going hockey. Uh, so you started doing a lot of radio stuff and especially in the hockey world. Yeah. So that was that was just like the timing of the lightning. So I'm from Tampa and I'm pretty tapped into the Tampa network. And a lot of people know that I'm a big Tampa fan. So it was pretty cool when they made the Stanley Cup run. You know, I had uh, had some old friends in the soccer media that were working in hockey and they were all around Tampa asking me if I wanted to come on and do a different a couple of different things and kind of be the hype man for the uh, for the Tampa Bay Lightning. So that was fun. And it's, you know, one of the businesses that I'm involved in now, my family's business does a lot of stuff with every other sport besides soccer. So I've always been a fan of all these other sports. And I think there are a lot of goalies that relate to that because I think there are a lot of goalies that enjoy other sports as well. So for me, it was a very. You know, my relationship with soccer last year was a very, I'm not going to be involved in it at all. And that's evolved a lot, which is, which, you know, which was necessary. I mean, look, I mean, I think one of the things this is that, and we're going to talk about it today when we talk about transitional skill sets is that you have to have well-rounded activities. It can't just be, you know, and, and that's how I think, Jeff, one of the issues that I see a lot with, with younger players right now is that they're so goalkeeper centric focused at eight or nine years old, such tunnel vision that they, they don't realize there's a whole other world of things for them to do and experience, especially as youth players. Absolutely. And I, you know, I agree with that. And that's a huge part of the reason that I wanted to come on because as I have gotten into coaching and we'll dive into this more, that's a conversation that just comes up nonstop with parents. And that's a question that you get asked all the time, but you know, especially if you look at, at, if you're looking at goalies who have had success recently and some American guys who have been playing and had a lot of success, they're very well-rounded individuals, you know, whether they have other hobbies, whether it's other sports, there are a lot of things that go into the makeup of a goalie where I actually think that if you're only playing goalie all the time, you don't really get that nice well-rounded picture that you're looking for at the end of the day. You know, and, 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 and one of the things about that too, that you just brought up, I love the fact that you just brought up in regards to the fact that like, you know, look at Matt Turner, obviously, who's now at Arsenal. You know, I mean, he he started late from a traditional goalkeeping standpoint. Uh, but the fact that he had played other sports mean, meant he understood team building. He understood being a leader. He understood hand-eye coordination. Um, and, and I think, Jeff, one of the things that people always say is that, like, an athlete is always going to be an athlete. And it's just a matter of getting them comfortable with the movements. I agree with that 100%. And it's funny, I was speaking with someone the other day, and we were just kind of sharing some stories. And, you know, the Matt, the Matt Turner story, everybody knows now, right? It was front and center during the World Cup. But even a guy like Sean Johnson, I remember playing against him in college. 
and speaking with people because he went to USF or he went to UCF, I went to USF rivals, you know, but speaking with people in the same circles that are like, you should see this UCF goalie. If we could get him off the basketball court, he'd be incredible. Like if we could get him to stop going and playing basketball and having fun playing basketball, then, you know, we could really get him going. And then obviously, you know, they got him off the basketball court. He went to UCF and, you know, the rest is history. He's one of the best goalies in American soccer history. So there's a lot of well-rounded goalies out there that played other sports and did other things. And I think that all the skills, you know, you think about basketball, imagine Sean Johnson going up for a rebound, same thing as him going up for a cross, right? So there's a lot of other movements and a lot of other athletic, athletic things that you could do that evolve into the goalkeeper position. And I actually think it's like the alpha position of all the different sports put together. But I think you know one of the counter things that to that, and and a lot of people bring this up, especially soccer aficionados or or you know soccer, for lack of better, snobs, is they'll say, yeah, but look at the game. Like, no disrespect, Jeff, but like the game that you came up with and the game that I came up with, because we're not that far off in age here. Um, it's a different game, and you know the goalkeeper really is part of the spine now. So they say, well. Yes, but you know, you take a 14, 15 year old who has no foot skills and throw them into a competitive environment. How are they going to be able to survive? So, what do you, what do you kind of say to that? For sure, but I also I also think though I also think that you know I'm not saying completely neglect the game of soccer, but I'm saying yeah. if you're dedicating your if you're dedicating all of your time 24 seven to soccer, I'd be more worried about somebody getting burnt out than I would be about you know whether or not their touch is exactly perfect. And you know, for someone that either had to learn and evolve with their feet in the professional levels, because that's what I had to do. There's, there's an, there's a evolution that takes place of when you're playing, but at the same time, I think you can develop those feet skills and develop your touch on the ball while also doing other things. Like, I don't think that that is out of the realm of possibility. See, I think, and, and I think that you all, and I'm putting you all, you know, kind of in, in a category, like not a derogatory category, but in the fact that like your generation of, of, goal, of goalkeepers that came up in the pro ranks from mid 2000s to the early 2010s, kind of, you know, burgeoning into the professional career were kind of that last group that had gotten trained in the traditional goalkeeping sense, you know, cones shuffling through catch and handle, you know, uh, handling crosses, that sort of a thing. Because the new age goalkeeping coaching, and you're noticing this now that you're you're a young coach yourself. Um, I'm putting you. I'm saying young coach. You know, uh, you're a you're a veteran, uh, wild, wily uh, presence in soccer, but but for coaching wise, you know, you're you're still on, on the young side here. It's being trained very differently now. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, there's a lot more involvement, you know, with their feet, and there's a lot more involvement of how you got to be attached to the game and things like that, and you know. For a long time, I was a very long believer in all the things that I just said. But, you know, as you're speaking and things like that, the game has evolved and the position has evolved. And when I'm training these kids, you know, there are a lot more foot movements and things like that you're, that you're doing. But I will not I'm not going to say that do, playing only goalkeeper and dedicating everything that you're doing to goalkeeping at a young age is the only way that you're going to be successful, because I just don't yeah. believe that to be true. And I think that there's there's something to be said about coaching in general of involving goalkeepers going on with players when they're using their feet right yeah. like a lot of times the, a lot of times the way the coaching is set up at least in my experience is what I'm seeing is you know the goalkeepers go do their own thing and then they come back in and they're part of the group then but you know I think that there if if there's a stress on evolving the position and getting goalies better with their feet start putting them in tight spaces start putting them in those small sided games start putting them in situations where they have to see the field a little bit differently and they're they're surrounded by pressure constantly so that their feet have to improve. That's just something that will happen and it'll come naturally as you're involving your goalkeepers inside of those training sessions. You, you know, Phil Wedden uh, obviously was at Philadelphia Union now as the director of goalkeeping over there and, and has been involved in U.S. soccer for years and years and years has brought up the fact that, you know, we need to start doing a better job of working with our goalkeepers in the proper areas that the actions actually happen. And, you know, as a professional playing at the MLS level, you know, you'll you'll go out to a youth field and you'll see these actions being taken place, you know, in these deep positions. But in reality, the way the game's being played now with the higher positions, a lot of these actions are taking place towards the top of the 18. So I'm even seeing, you know, over Jake Davis over at Houston Dynamo working with his youth players, working on heading to clear. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember ever doing that as a youth player. Yeah, there's definitely an importance on, you know, keeping that high line. And just cutting out through balls because the more the teams are playing higher up, you need your goalie to be engaged and all that. 
But at the same time, I think that, you know, I'd be interested to listen back and, and check out some of the episodes of these guys talking about that, because one of the hardest things that I've found is coaching. And then, you know, through conversations is replicating those in pressure moments in, in pressure, those in under pressure moments of games. How, how do you replicate that so that the goalie feels comfortable doing it in a game? You know, that has been to me, to be completely honest, that has been the hardest struggle that I've had because how do you figure out these game-like situations when the training, you know, when goalkeeper training in general is so not involved with the team that you're doing it separately. So that's something that I need to learn and involve in doing as well. But that's a good point. You know, towards the end of my career, I, you know, I was winning more headers and, and working on things like that than I've ever done before. And that's a very, very solid point. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. So obviously, you know, you made the decision to, you know, to hang up the gloves from a playing standpoint, uh, I think it was last year you made the official announcement, right? It was last year you made the official yes, announcement? Yes, yes. Beginning of the year, okay. yep. Okay. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, you you had these other things that you had been doing during COVID, the broadcasting, you know, um, you know, the different companies, the, the entrepreneurial companies that uh, as, 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 a bet, as, as the best way probably to put it right now. Um, but regarding coaching, like, when were you like, oh, you know what? I think I'm actually going to give this a stab and not just as something kind of to pass the time while I'm waiting to come back. Well, it was actually kind of funny. So during the during the 2020 season, um, you know, for whatever reason, I wasn't on the roster. And then something came up where we had a little bit of a, a health scare. And then I had the opportunity to kind of coach the guys or like run through some training sessions and, and get some guys warmed up for games and whatnot. And that was kind of like the the first I was like, oh, you know, I, I'm kind of enjoying leaning from this angle or like being involved in this way. So I'm starting to kind of feel that out and start to enjoy that a little bit. And then when I retired and moved home, like I said, I took a little bit of a hiatus. I took my, I took a break. I took a little, I needed a break from all things soccer just to kind of clear my mind. And then as I started to slowly get back involved in the game, I started doing a little bit of scouting for MLS next. I started doing a couple little things here and there throughout the year. I'm watching these goalies. And the only thing I can think about is how I can help them. And that I had so much knowledge just built up throughout the years of playing and things like that, that it's almost I'm doing, I almost feel like I'm doing a disservice to the goalkeeper community if I'm not passing down knowledge and trying to help, you know, the next guys come up and give them opportunities that, you know, my connections and things like that have presented. So it was really a combination of a bunch of things coming together. And now that I'm back on the field, it's, it's more of a passion of how can I help these guys get to the next level? How can I teach these things that you learn along the way? I mean, you look, I, th I think, you know, one of the cool things that you said about that first off that, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like that's gotta be such a weird type of situation where they're like, Hey Jeff, uh, you can't play, but, uh, make these guys better, make these guys better. So, uh, so they, they can play. And I was in that situ same situation too, uh, with a USL team where they're essentially like, look, we're, uh, it was like that major league scene, you know, where like, uh, he's like, ah, one more season. And he's like, oh, no, we all uh, want you to stay on, but uh, he's a coach. And you're like, ah, I can't, I can't do that. Um, uh, there's probably so many kids right now who have no idea what I'm talking about. Major League. It's a classic. Late classic. 80s. Classic. classic. I'm sure classic. it's extremely problematic now, and I'm sure it would get me canceled. But, yeah, it's a classic. So uh, check good. it out. It's still a good movie. movie. It's a funny yeah. movie. Yeah, based on the Cleveland Guardians, uh, I guess that's what we got to call them now, right? Um, but but speaking of that, so you're doing that, and um, you know the warm up aspect and and kind of getting them ready was that an interesting dynamic because like these had been your not only competitors but your teammates at the same time, and now they're looking at you as an authority figure. No, I mean I wouldn't go as far as looking at me as an authority figure as much okay. as I would. You know, I think that. I think that in that moment, it was more of a, you know, that year was a weird year in general where everyone was just kind of like, you got to do what you got to do to get through the season. And, you know, everybody's kind of helping everybody. And, you know, there's a lot of team unity and a lot of team bonding that goes on when you're going through something like that inside a locker room. Cause it was, I mean, we all know, we don't have to talk about it. It was the craziest time that we've, any yeah, of us yeah. have ever been through. So was this in really, Orlando? Was this, this in Orlando? In, this is in Portland. This is in Portland later okay. in the year. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so it was really just a situation where, Needed, the team needed a little bit of help and you know I wasn't playing at the time so there's no reason that I wouldn't help them and I'm a big you know I'm a huge I'm a huge you know you're competing with goalies you're constantly competing all the time you got to work together you got to compete against each other which is a very weird dynamic but at the end of the day I think that if you've ever played the goalkeeper position 
you know exactly what somebody is going through when they're on the field and you know the yeah. types of pressure that they're under, you know that the stress that they're under constantly. And in any situation, I'm going to do something to help the goalkeeper, you know, to help the goalkeeper group if they need my help, because I'm not, you know what I mean? I don't make the decisions who plays the, the guys that are on the field. Don't make the decisions who plays. That's up to the coach. You compete yeah. against each other, but at the same time, you want to help out your teammates and ultimately help the team have success. So it wasn't one of those situations where, you know, I was like, you got to jump these cones, you got to do these hurdles. And like, you know, I wasn't one of those. It was more of a, it was more of a, the team needed me to help and the goal. You know what I mean? I'm friends with the goalie. So of course I would help. I mean, dude, luckily Memo's got a shed full of all sorts of different equipment. So like all you have to he do is more just go, equipment. In, go in there. <laughs> he has more equipment. He has more equipment than any coach I've ever seen in my life. And he uses every single piece of it too. It's actually really impressive. I wouldn't even know how to use all the pieces of equipment that he has. That's unreal. It's like, he's got an entire LA fitness in that shed. Yeah, just go. <laughs> it really does. It's, it's a, it is a goalkeeper. You open it up and it's like a goalkeeper mecca. It's like, oh my gosh, they have everything. <laughs> oh my god, guys! So it's like, so we're waiting for like the e-commerce, the online memo store where he's just got all this gear. He's like, look, he's like, uh, officially, uh, just uh, uh, practice training used, uh, twenty twenty one. Uh, I'm selling this right now. Um, but no. Speaking of entre entrepreneurial, he should start up his own little like, this is what I have and this is where you can get it. His own little website of these are the tools you need. That would actually be a smart idea. But it's brilliant, dude. I think we're just pitching an idea for Memo right here. So Memo, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, you got to check this out. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your entre entrepreneurial stuff because it's going to kind of you know segue into the transition about you know transitional skill sets. Dude, what 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 is this? You have like 17 startups. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't go that far. So I did. I did have the book company, but unfortunately, we had to. We had to put. That's not a great business. Like, which I didn't learn until Re reading. You know, reading people don't like reading. Is that what you're saying? Read, reading's great, but the book business is kind of hard. So, which I learned. I learned that. I learned that a little bit down the road. But okay. uh, but no. So I, I worked for my family's company, which was a startup. Um, they started it 24 years ago, so it's past the stage of a startup now. But it was something that was new to me, and I'm really like diving into and getting into, and then started up my own academy down here uh, that I'm trying to, you know, develop and build, but kind of do it the right way instead of, you know, mass numbers as opposed, I'm trying to get, you know, very low numbers at first and build it and try to, you know, train goalies the right way and things like that. So I have a couple of fun things going on down here that have been really keeping me busy. So, so you got, so you got that going on, you've got your family business, um, the publishing world, you didn't want to end up in a knives out type situation. So you're like, I'm good. Chewed me up, chewed me up and spit <laughs> me out that publishing world. It's brutal. Um, it's brutal. So, and then, uh, and then did you do, do, you're doing something with apparel too? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. So our family company is Smack Apparel. And then, um, so, you know, it's just fun sports shirts. It's funny. We had, uh, we just made a United, Leeds United States shirt, which is pretty funny because, you know, that's a hot topic in soccer right now. And then uh, I do a little bit of work with a glove company as well called Renegade. And, you know, it's just about everything that I'm doing right now is about marketing and, and trying to build out and really just using that creative, that creative energy that you need, that you need to be a goalie and just transitioning it to, to other things. So, you know, I really want to come on and just speak about, especially to the, hopefully to the parents and to the younger goalies that are listening, just the skill sets that if you, you know, I'm speaking from a place of the privilege of being a pro goalie and I had that yeah. experience. But just kind of speaking from the place of the skill sets that you learn as you're going through the position that really benefit you later in life. And that's kind of the experience that I've been having right now. So it's something that I feel like is very relatable to a lot of young boys out there. So I want to before before we do that, though, I do just want to present this right here because I think uh, I think everyone in the world here might enjoy this and dig this. Uh, uh, somebody clearly. Uh... <laughs> You uh, you you're, you're definitely already already uh, throwing some stick at uh at, at some different people with this stuff. Um, oh, you dude, think honestly, so? I think it's funny. I think it's funny. I think it's great. I think it's great. Um, I think yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I, I all, but I also think it's great for American soccer. You know, I mean, you know, the 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 joke is, and we were talking about this, you know, off the air and everything like that. Is that like, you know, when it comes to the Euro snobs, like, hey, if you can get results, they don't care where you're from. You could have the whole team could be the U.S. men's national team. And if like if they're not relegated, they're happy with it. So um, but I mean, to be but, fair, but, to be fair, they're leaning into it, too. So it's not like it's not like the you know, they're leaning into it as well with their with their social campaign. So it's not like, oh, it's, yeah, you know, it's not like it's a thing that's unspoken. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely. So let, let, let's get a little bit in, into this right here and let's talk about kind of like, you know, you with the youth coaching and everything like that. So is this part of your academy right here, like this picture that we're seeing right here? 
No, this is so. This is from the MLS Next program. I was invited to okay. go. Yeah, I was invited to go out to Dallas and and you know train some kids and just do a little bit of scouting for them. So it was just, it was a great group of goalies, great group of kids that came out and you know it's just one of those things where you get to share your story, kind of speak to them a little bit about what their goals are and what their ambitions are, and you know hopefully you're able to find some players for some different academies around the country. Yeah, I, I think Jeff, you know, one of the things, you know, as we're kind of gearing into into the topic now and kind of getting to the meat and potatoes, as John Bush uh, would say, is that we're saying skill sets, skill sets, skill sets. I think there might be some parents out there that don't really know what we mean by these skill sets. So in your opinion, like what are what do we mean by these skill sets, these intangible skill sets? It's it's the one. I mean, the first one is the easiest one is the leadership ability right? Like the skill set of being a leader, that is not something that comes easy for everybody. And it's not something that, you know, is, is universal, but to be a goalie and to be on the field and to be a good goalie, being a leader is something that you have to be. It's, you know, whether you're the captain, whether you're the most raw, 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 raw guy, it doesn't matter. But when you're on the field and you're having success, learning how to lead a group is something that you have to do. And it's just something that carries over with you into that next, into that next world. Right. Like you walk into an environment and you have a presence about you that people know that you're you're somebody that is a leader and you're going to step up and that things are, you know what I mean? When you're around, things are going to be OK and you, you, you take ownership of that. And that's something for me that has really been something that has carried over big time. And that I mean, skill set number one. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, when, when you're talking about that skill set right there, when we're talking about leadership, and I, I do agree, that is the, that is the number one skill set that transfers over, is that one of the things I've seen with a lot of young players is that it doesn't transfer over because they're confident in their goalkeeping abilities. But when they go into the classroom, they're not as confident. So, like, what do you say to that? How do they bring that same mentality to the classroom? I think that for me, it's just more of those one of those things where, to be a goalie, you have to have extreme confidence in yourself and you have to have extreme confidence in that no matter what situation is thrown at you, you're going to adapt and you're going to figure out a way to, to figure it out. Right. And take that energy that you have when you're standing in between the field and carry it with you wherever you're going. Right. If you're walking into a classroom, you know, don't walk in. They talk about it all the time. When you walk onto the field, when you walk into a situation, walk in right back, back straight, chest up, head high, confident in what you're doing and no matter what the situation is you're walking into even if you're walking into it away from the field take that energy put it to yourself in the classroom put it to yourself if you're going into work wherever it may be and carry that over with you so that you're you know what i mean if you have that belief in yourself in any situation that you're going into then people are going to start radiating off of that and you know that kind of confidence i believe that it carries over you know, uh, it's it's funny that you just said that right there because I didn't even think about that as a skill set. But body language, man, that is a skill set we learn as goalkeepers that really oh, does yeah. translate, man. Because, like, we're taught so much. No hands on your hips. No slumping over. You know, standing straight. You know, be attentive. You know, all those sorts of things. And I'm just thinking about my own life. Like, I need to start thinking about, like, if, as if I'm inside the 18-yard box. Like, when I walk into a room. It's well, crazy. It's it's one of those things too, right? Like you learn, you learn from a young age as a goalkeeper, if you give up a goal, if you fail, right? If you make a mistake, if you fail, it's all about how your reaction is and how you're, how you're putting off that energy for your teammates to see, for the fans to see, for your coach to see. It's not, it's not as much as it is about the fact that you made the mistake as much as it is, okay, how is he reacting? How is she reacting to this mistake? Am I still confident in what they're doing right now? Are they still confident? And even in the worst moments, Right. I've made mistakes, big mistakes and big moments. And then if you stand there slouched over, very sad, people are going to look back and be like, I don't know if they're OK. I don't know if I have the confidence. But it's the same thing if you don't do well in school, but, you know, you keep getting back up and you keep trying and you want and you're confident in what you're doing. And you don't start the slouch. I think that that carries you a long way. And it really, you know, it gives off a good outside presence, but it also builds your own self-esteem up. It starts building you up when you're standing tall and walking tall and putting your shoulders back in any situation that you're walking into. You know, one, one of the things I was just thinking about in regards to like transitional skill sets is just the simple fact of like specificity, because as goalkeepers, we are taught to train specifically and for certain movements and actions. And I think a lot of kids, you know, and I'm, I'm using youth because there's a lot of youth that are listening right here, but obviously adults too, when they go into the workplace, if they took their work specifically as opposed to the macro, but they focused, they looked at the micro 
you know, little details, I think a lot of kids would see a lot more success with their homework, uh, with tests, all that sort of thing. Because I think a lot of them approach is like, oh, I need to get my finals done as opposed to like, what are the specific areas in order to achieve the goal of making the finals done? Like when you go into a game, you don't go like, oh, we just need to get a result. You go like, I need to make sure that my footwork is clean in this direction right here or that my drop step is here or is that I, I read that trigger and that cue. It's also, you know, I'll take that one step further too, right? As goalkeepers, you're constantly evaluating the entire situation as it unfolds, right? You, that's part of the process that you have to go through when you're trying to organize or when you're trying to really, you know, get a feel for the game. It's the ball might be, right? The ball might be all the way down on the other side of the field, but then you start seeing your right back creep up. You start seeing your midfielder move over. You start seeing things space out a little bit. And you got to really observe the whole picture of what's going on and process it. And then as the game keeps coming towards you, you start to narrow in on what you need to do to have that success. But giving yourself a wide view of kind of in like taking in information and just the, the amount that you have to take in and process rapidly, you know, life in some situations I've experienced, life happens pretty rapidly, but like, Nothing happens as rapid as the ball's on the other side of the field, long clearance, my center back is out. How do I, you know what I mean? The process that takes, that takes place in that like 30 second span of no danger to immediate danger. Things don't happen like that a lot in the real life, unless you're, you know, in a dangerous situation, but there's a processing that takes place that has a, that carries over outside of the field. If you're able to take that skill set and apply it to other things. You know, and, and I think, you know, you bringing about, about processing too just makes me think about like, I'll be honest with you. I think a lot of goalkeepers are more prepared for going into the workplace or going into, you know, a school or a coaching environment than a lot of outfield players because we are used to communicating. At least if you're at a high level, um, you had to be a good communicator. Otherwise, you wouldn't get there. You know, can you can you elaborate a little bit more on like how that's helped you? It's it's just the openness and the willingness to to talk and process information, right? Like you have a lot of teammates that you have a lot of teammates where the conversation it just really isn't there because they go out there and play and they do that. But as a goalkeeper, you gotta be constantly communicating, trying to figure out what what other people are doing so that you can figure out what you want to do and it's funny. One of the, one of the skill sets too, I'm sorry. I'm kind of like spinning this a little bit. No, it's all the, good. One of the skill sets. Go off on any funny. tangent you want to go the, on, man. It's all good. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I like to talk. But yeah. That's probably why I was a goalie, right? That's probably because yeah, I yeah. enjoy talking so much, but one of the, one of the skill sets that some of the advice that I got, I got a goalie named Scott Garlic. You guys remember Scott? You remember Scott oh, yeah. Garlic? Played Tampa, Bay, Tampa Bay mutiny, right? Tampa yeah. Bay guy. Yep. Great guy. We linked up, you know, we linked up pretty early in my retirement. I've known him for a while and, and some of the advice that I've heard that he has given is there's no environment in a workplace where you are working and you have to work with your competition and, and get along and be friendly with the person that you're openly competing with while also helping them get better at their job. And then once you walk into the workplace, that doesn't really exist. So it's a, it's a, it's a situation that you have to adapt so much to this type of unique situation and learn how to do it. That if you're able to, that if you're able to do that and like get through it and be successful, you can pretty much step into just about anything. But dude, I, I love what you just said right there because I think that's one of the big big mistakes that I think a lot of goalkeepers or any type of athlete, you know, competitive athlete has when they go into the workplace or you know they're in school or whatever is they look at everybody else as competition as opposed to collaborators. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you are able to compartmentalize while you're playing and understanding that, yes, I'm competing with this person, but it's about collaboration for the good of the team, because ultimately I don't make the decision on who plays. So it's just about making sure that the entire unit, the goalkeeping union, no pun intended, is ready to play. It's the truth. That's what makes it the that's what makes it the most unique, beautiful, beautiful position in all of sports. I need I need their help. I'm competing with this person, but if I don't get their help every single day in training, then I'm going to fail. And it's vice versa and it's across the board. And I I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about like, just like, you know, going into coaching, you know, because obviously you've started out now coaching and, um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they go into coaching as players is they still have that playing mentality. That was my mistake. I was still like, ah, let me get out there. Let me get some reps, you know? And then next thing I know, like I've got a director being like, dude, like you're not here to work out. Like what is going on here? Um, so not to admit, you got you, the ice bags too, probably. Yeah, ex- exactly, dude. And it's like I'm like, no, I'm like they're they're like they're like, no, there's like a time and place. So it's like, you know, you don't need to be training with these U elevens. Like you can't, you don't have to do that. It's all it's all good. Like, you know, although the ball is smaller, so it's easier to hold on to. So I like that. I like that part. Um, but but you, you know, you talking about being able to work together in that unit, is that a skill set that now when you go into coaching? you're able to remove that competitive element because you've already been comfortable working for a common goal? I believe so. Like, so I'm, I'm at a point in this, I mean, I retired for a reason, you know, I'm at a point where I have no ambitions of getting in the goal and hitting the ground. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't really excite me anymore. A lot of it's because, you know, my body hurts for a very long time after I do it now. And, you know, my body's not built for that anymore. But I think that having that take that, take that competitive energy. And this is what I like to do. You take that competitive energy and you, and you put it into your kit and into the people that you're working with, right? You, if they make a big save, you get excited for them. Like you made the big save. If they make a mistake, you take that moment to, okay, how would I want to be talked to in this moment where I'm clearly frustrated? What are the things that are going on that I can help this person so that the next time I hit that same exact shot, they have that competitive edge. They have that feeling of, I just accomplished everything. And I think that finding that success, finding that success through the kids that you're coaching or having that competitive spirit and kind of like translating it into the kids that you are coaching, for me, that's everything. And, and that's how I get my competitive edge off. You know, if I'm watching a training and some defenders aren't helping out my goalie, I go to my goalie and I say, hey, you need to command these people to do X, Y, and Z, or else ultimately we are the ones that are suffering. So it's a, it's always keeping it as a cohesive unit while at the same time, like using that energy and trying to translate it over to the kids that you're coaching. But how do you like, how do you keep from being on an island? Because you, you were so used to in the playing, in your playing experience, you know, being, working with the goalkeeping staff and the other goalkeepers. And then yes, you did interact with the team obviously and everything like Mm -hmm. that, but from a, coaching standpoint now let's say you're in a collegiate environment or a youth club environment how do you become part of the system as opposed to just uh and and for lack of a better term a tool for the system do you mean like how do you involve yourself more in practices or how do you get your how do you get yeah because the thing is is like because i think that's one of the problems with a lot of young goalkeeper coaches is like they understand goalkeeping but because they never really spent any time working with the outfield coaches or having conversations or being in those coaching rooms and all they know is playing, they come into that environment just thinking about the goalkeepers and not about the macro of the team. That's an interesting point. And to be completely honest, like I don't, I don't have the right answer for that because through my, through my playing and through my development, I've always, I've always, you know, you sit in on the meetings, you sit in on the film sessions, you, you sit in with the defense, you do these different things. So that when you're watching the game, the goalkeeper coach doesn't really ever talk in those meetings. The people that are talking in the meetings are the defensive coach, the attacking coach, the head coach. And then, you know, the goalkeepers kind of process at the end of it. So I've always just kind of felt comfortable voicing my opinion to to the field coaches or if there's something that I see that defensively and the goalkeeper need to work on together, speak with them about integrating everybody so that everybody can get on the same page. But if you are going through that, just process just learning and being kind of like a sponge to these other positions and when you're watching film you know if you have questions about things that are going down up the field or just things like that just learning as much as you can from the other coaches because if you don't know what's going on with them you're not really going to know what to tell your goalkeepers as a part of as the game evolves and you want your goalkeepers to be playing with their feet up the field things like that now the now the game is very interactive with the rest of the team. So you have to get yourself involved in these conversations. I think you just brought up a really good point. And I, I I didn't even just think about this, you know, but obviously, you know, you playing at a high level, it's a different experience. A lot of young coaches coming into the game as coaches, you know, they either played at a, 
at a high youth competitive level or uh, or a reasonable collegiate level. And let's just say maybe it's not as integrated, maybe it's not as as advanced and as robust uh, because of the resources that are available. But you're bringing up the fact of just curiosity, which I think is a skill set that you, you know, coming from a, a professional environment or any any player coming from the environment of wanting to learn and keep growing, um, that's a skill set that a lot of people who didn't play don't have. No, it's true. And it's, you know, you, the goalkeeper position, I've always, I've always felt like the goalkeeper position was the game within the game, right? Like there's a big game going on and then there's two guys on the field that are playing their own game and you're a huge part of it, but you're, you're playing a completely different game. But if you're not, if, if you're not trying to learn what's going on in front of you and you're only solely focused on what you're doing, if you're not trying to learn what everybody else on the field is doing, then how can you lead? How can you how can you give direction that's constructive to what the rest of the guys are doing? And that's just the way that I kind of look at the whole goalkeeper position as a whole. So so let me ask a question. And by the way, anybody who's who's watching the show live right now, please put some questions in there or or share some, you know, some stories uh, if you want of how these skill sets have either helped you or helped, you know, uh, other other players that you've worked with and you've seen them grow off the field as well, too, because we'd love to hear. But I want to talk about just the simple fact of like these skill sets aren't just born like they have to be developed. So like Jeff, now that you were running your own Academy, like how do you start incorporating session designs that develop these skill sets in these players from a young age and how young is too young? You know, that is a very solid question and I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know the complete right answer to that. Okay. And, but I think that, I think that as a goalkeeper is if you, if you continue to evolve in the position, right. As a coach, what I like to do is I like to constantly tell, tell my kids, tell the kids that I'm coaching that these are the things that you need to do in order to have success. You need to get, you need, your presence needs to be known at all times when you're on the field, you need to lead, you need to communicate. You need to do these things in order to be successful. If you make a mistake, you have to pick your head up and you have to keep moving and you have to show that at all times you are in complete control. And these are the things that I just harp on my harp on the kids I coach all the time. I tell them this all the time. If they put their head down in a drill, get your head up. If they're standing there and they're telling me they want one more rep with their hands on my, with their hands on their knees, I'm not going to give you another rep because your body language is telling me that you're mm-hmm. that you're done that you're sad or that you're giving up or that you're tired. So it's just these things that I just keep over time. I just tell them and I tell them and I tell them. And I'm sure they're probably like, wow, Jeff is so annoying. He keeps telling me the same thing. But like with most things, eventually it starts to click. And then they start presenting themselves that way. They start carrying themselves that way. And I think that just really instilling the the things that it takes to not the on-field things where it's, you know, the footwork or the diving or the, you know, dive forward, all those things. Those things you you train, you practice, you train, but just continually to harp what it takes to be a successful goalkeeper in terms of the the leadership, those skill sets that we talked about, just stay on them, 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 and then eventually they start clicking, and then the next thing you know, the goalies are confident, they're they're carrying themselves in a way that they need to be carrying themselves, and that's been my that's been my approach. Whether or not there's a better approach, I'm sure there is a better approach, but that's what I've had success with. Well, as, as, as some, you know, some great goalkeeper coaches out there in the world have always said, you know, it's, there's not a right way or a wrong way. There's just different ways. Um, so there's, there's, it's, so, you know, it, if it, if it's working for you and you're seeing results, that's really what matters. Um, just, just a simple matter as same in regards to technical training or tactical training. Um, I do want to talk about this. though. I want to talk about classroom sessions because I think, you know, now I think they're becoming much more. I remember back in the day, um, you know, you would get the parents up in arms and it's like, it's like, you know, I don't pay for my kids to sit in a classroom. They sit in a classroom all day because they don't recognize the value of it. But how does having classroom sessions and breaking down film with these young players who may have never done this before with their, with their youth clubs, you know, how does that benefit them starting to see the game from a different standpoint and starting to, develop these skill sets of, of recognizing triggers and cues, which I think is something that in life we need to be able to start doing and reading triggers and cues, you know, in the workplace. Well, it's all, it's also brand new, isn't it? It's also, it's also different. It's uh, I, my parents would have been the same way, but 
it's one of those things where you just get a different perspective and you get a different voice. And, and, you know, I never watched more film in my life than I watched with Memo. You know, we talked about Memo earlier and Memo, we watched film constantly and it just gives you a different lens and it gives you a different voice. You break down, you remember the moments that you're in and you remember what you were thinking in that moment. And then when you're able to kind of pull yourself back and get a wider lens and get other people's opinions on what they think is going on, you're able to just get a very, very different perspective than you are, you know, standing in the box and watching the game unfold right in front of you. So when you're able to break those things down for kids and kind of say, hey, you know, when he puts his head down, this is a cue. When your age does this, this is a cue. It just presents a different wide lens and it gives you the opportunity to understand what the kid understand what the kids were thinking in the moment and why they did what they did. And relating to that, understanding it, and then giving them another another viewpoint of you know, this is, this is probably what should have happened. I understand why you were thinking that way. But now when you see this situation unfold, be aware that this is something that could also happen. So it just gives you that other viewpoint, other perspective that you don't get when you're just playing. And, and I think, you know, one of the things too, that, that I like nowadays, and, and you know, when we're talking about, you know, developing these skill sets in young players, I think back in the day, people used to, you know, go, Hey, you need to be a leader. And you need to watch film and you need to be specific and you need to blah, blah, blah. And we start putting the blame on them for not performing these skills or having these skill sets. But in reality, it's our job as educators to teach them how to develop these skill sets. So I think, you know, you, the fact that like you're encouraging people, not only encouraging them, but actually walking them through the process, I think is massive. Well, it's, it's, you know, if you tell someone to go watch film by themselves about a moment that they screwed up, you're only, they're only going to like, you know, and it's only going to get them more mad. And it's, mm-hmm. it's something where you have to, you have to take the knowledge that you have in that outside perspective and, and get them in a moment of calm and just, you know, for lack of a better term too, if they make a mistake, you got to throw your arm around them and break down why they made the mistake in terms of, and take the emotions out of it, which is a very hard thing to do. You just brought up a great point. That I, this was a skill set I wasn't even thinking about, but like this is such a transitional skill set to in life uh, that us as goalkeepers are very fortunate to have, and that is the ability to forget and move on. Um, you know, or and at understand least push that, it back. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just understand yeah. that it, it will. Yeah, no, trust me, dude. I mean, just I'm still <laughs> thinking about. I'm still thinking about last week when I didn't know what the goal differential was for us to advance in a in, in the in the mini tournament that I'm playing in right now. You know, and I led in one in the second near the end of the second half, and I was like, yeah, we'll we'll be fine. And they're like, no, dude, we're out. I'm like, ah, oh, I would have gone harder on that smother if I had known that. I uh, oh, I just thought Sorry. I just thought we were through. They're like, no, the other team won uh, by a seven goal uh, differential. So they made that up on us. I'm like, who? Who was this team? Who, who did they play? Children? Who did they play? It's you got to see, thought... see if the fix was in. That's a lot. Oh, dude. You see absolutely. If the fix was in. Absolutely. Like, what, seven guys showed up? Like, what exactly happened <laughs> right there? Dude, the, yeah. I mean, that's like, I'm like, ah. They should have just forfeited. Uh, anyway, it was very frustrating. It was very annoying. And then also the worst part was, was like beforehand, like there was in the email thread, like this one guy, Jake, on our team. He's like, dude, there's no way we don't advance. He's like, we should. We don't even need to worry about it. I'm like, don't say things like that. How old are you? You know, like you should know by now. Classic. That's the it's classic the classic. Line, right? That's the classic yeah. line. Yeah. I mean, they would have to smash them. And they did. They, uh, by, they smashed By the exact number that they needed, actually. It's funny how that yeah. worked out. Yeah, exactly. I know. Oh my God. You're right. Cause they did. They advanced by one goal. Uh, that's hilarious. God. Oh my God. Uh, so sorry annoying. To bring, sorry to bring up, sorry to bring up. Sorry no, to bring that's up okay. Rough, it's rough, okay. Uh, but it's moment. okay. But the thing is, is that like, we do obviously remember, but we have to have a short memory and we also have to be able to put it aside and move on, move on. And a lot of people who've never experienced being in goal, I'll be honest with you. I can't tell you how many, um, midfielders, you know, out, you know, outfielder, you know, who play midfield when they, when their session's not working or they're, uh, they lose a job or something like that, they can't handle it because they're not used to the stakes being so high. And we are, we're like, if the ball gets past us, it's a goal. It's the craziest. I mean, it's the craziest thing that you could possibly learn. And it's, you make a mistake or, I mean, you give up a goal, whatever, you know what I mean? Like if it's a good goal, if it's a nice goal. Yeah. 
congratulations. But we've all been there. You make a mistake in a game and your team pays the ultimate price, which is a goal. And you're standing there knowing that you made this massive mistake and you know that eyes are on you. You know that every single person, if it's parents, if it's people on the field, if it's people in the stands, they're thinking, what was that? What just happened? What was that? And you have to stand there. You have to take that. You have to take it off and continue to perform at a high level. I don't know where else you can learn that in the type of pressure situation that you get as a goalkeeper. And any type of pressure, if you're able to do that and you're able to and you're able to figure out whatever it is that whether you have to talk to yourself, whatever your process is to get through that situation, applies to any other any other mistake or any type of thing that you're gonna deal with for the rest of your life. And the stakes are so much higher when you feel like literally every single person that's there to watch that game is staring down at you. And if you're able to get through that, I truly believe you can pretty much get through anything. You know, and I, and I think, you know, you're just bringing up the mental health aspect because I think, you know, one of the things that m makes us stronger is being able to handle that. And I think mental health obviously is a massive issue when it comes to not just youth sports, but the massive. society, society in, in general. And if and you can position. compartment, yeah. And if you can <laughs> compartmentalize, like you're going to be in such a better, better position, um, you know, in, in any, in anything, a job interview, a school uh, application, anything like that. Cause I, I can't tell you how many people who've never been in this type of an environment, you know, goalkeeping or hockey goalie or, or, or you know, any, any, anything like that, where it's, where, where there's a very high stakes like that, you know, they, they can't handle, they can't even handle negative, you know, and this is a whole other conversation about the toxic toxicity of social media. That's a, that's an hour episode. And that's why the union was created. Uh, you know, um, is because of it's that. And, and that's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous, dangerous place. And it's, it's really not the, it's really not the right place for young players to be trying to learn, uh, because of, because of what's out there and it's misinformation and unregulated and every, anyway, that's a whole pitch for the union. But what I want to talk about is I want to talk about kids coaching, because I think one of the things that you don't learn unless you do, um, a lot of people out there and I've always encouraged young players out there to go coach because they'll see the game differently and they'll start developing these skill sets, you know, like being a leader, like communication, uh, like trial and error, all of that, that they might necessarily not necessarily develop in their youth environment as a player. No, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, the first the first private training that I ever gave, I was in high school. And, you know, it's one of those things where you have to learn, you have to learn how to communicate, you have to learn how to be patient, you have to learn all of the different things that your coach probably has to do with you are the things that you learn and you start to be a little bit more relatable to, you know, and it starts to help build that relationship even with your own coach. Because I always think that if you don't really understand if you don't put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you're not able to relate what they're going through or the decisions that they have to make or the reasons that they do separate things. And kind of like you said, man, it's a good way to break down communication and it's a good way to, to kind of learn the flip side of it. And you get to also watch other goalies and see what their mistakes are and how you would correct them. And you can apply that to the things that you're doing as well, because I'm sure a lot of mistakes that you see are probably things that you might not have thought about, or those are things that you take a step back at with a different lens and you apply that to their game, which would also ultimately kind of help what you're kind of doing yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, one of the things about that too, is that like it teaches you how to simplify things in a way that others can understand it. Because especially if you're a, if you're a young player, probably getting into coaching, chances are you're probably going to be working with some foundational age goalkeepers. So you really have to simplify things uh, like that. And guess what? this is a lesson that I've been learning in life too, is that most people don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I do need to be able to simplify it so that they, the lay person can understand what I'm talking about, which kind of segues into you, Jeff, you know, going into broadcasting and everything like that. Uh, you start getting in the weeds of goalkeeping. They have no idea what the hell you're talking about. It's funny. So I, I, I did my first USL games last year and I have, I have about nine or 10 lined up uh, for early in the season. And I told, I told the, I told the other guy in the booth with me, I was like, listen, I'm going to be hitting you with probably more goalie knowledge than a lot of people are going to come with. But I also think that we provide a different perspective to the game. You know, I think that we see the game 
from more of a step back type of lens sometimes. And I, it worked for me. I tried to keep out, you know, like the, you know, oh, look at his dive forward or like, look at this, look at that great set position or, you know, all the goalkeeper lingo that you need to use. But I also liked it because it was, I was able to kind of give props to goalies when they would make plays that might not be seen, you know, from the, from the people that don't understand goalkeeping and like break down why certain things were good or why things were, you know, a little bit more tougher than what, people see sorry i'm stumbling over my words no but. no dude but, I, but i'll be honest with you you know when we're talking about skill sets again the fact that you know memo had you watch so much film during your playing career prepared you for this activity you know in broadcasting because a lot of players who leave the game and go into and try to go into a broadcasting world um they they don't have that type those reps um so 100 you've got that's a very, all these that's a very reps. good point I didn't yeah. think about that. That's a very good point. Shout yeah. out memo if you're watching. <laughs> but be, but but the thing is too is that like I think a I think a really important thing for people to do out there for for young players out there to do is also to watch goalkeeper film with non goalkeepers because they're going to pick up things from the outfield players that you might not necessarily see, and then that's going to benefit your game. Because now you're like, oh, now I see what he was talking about, you know, because he's looking at the six or the nine or whatever. You know, I think so many times we just and, and this is that I'm a culprit of this as well, too. We insulate ourselves with other goalkeeper nerds and go, oh, well, well you, no one's going to understand this. It's like we're only going to watch this stuff together because no one's going to know that Jordan Pickford movement right there like I am or whatever. But they're like, no, dude, you sh you should have just seen what just happened right there, you know, with uh with with Mo Salak, you know, you didn't see this, I did because of this run that just happened and the play before, and I think that's a, th a skill set that I think is really really important moving into other facets of your life is seeing the moment before, and not just what's in front of you, um, in business, in school, if you don't know what just happened, you know, or see a couple steps ahead you're not going to be prepared for the moment. Well, it's kind of what we talked about, right? Like a couple of things that we, it's kind of coming full circle, right? Seeing the wider lens and, mm -hmm. and being able to process and develop things and think on the fly, things like that. But also kind of what we talked about how, you know, the goalkeeper coaches get, that, that get stuck only with the goalkeepers. It's the same thing that you just talked about. You got to go, you got to go seek out knowledge. You have to go seek out knowledge and you have to go try to learn why people are doing the things that you're doing so that you can adapt and understand, okay, if, if he's, if my center back's doing this, then that means that he thinks this is going on. And I either need to tell him that's not, that's not what's happening, or I need to get myself in a better position because then I know what the next scene is going to be coming. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, by the way, I want to, I want to pull this up right here because I, I want to, uh, I want everyone to see, let's see is if it everybody memo? can see. No, it's not, it's not memo. Let's see if you let's see if you can see this here. Nope, that's not that's, that's not the one I wanted. Ah, hold on. It's almost as if I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, all right, let's try this uh, here. Uh, share screen. Let's see window. I sent some. Oh. I sent some random pictures. I feel like. Yeah. There yeah. we go, dude. <laughs> there that we go. I this... to, that, I, I, that was one I sent to my wife, and then I was like, <laughs> "Here we go, first one." <laughs> so, but but the, here's the thing. That's the face that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people make when they first go into coaching. Uh, after they're done playing and they're, they're handed, you know, four eight-year-olds uh, and they're said, hey, teach them how to uh, catch a ball. And right. they make that face right there because they've, they've never been in that in that situation before. Um, as we start wrapping up, Jeff, and I appreciate you taking the time. You know, you've got, like I said, 17 different things going on. And uh, you're you're involved in the glove world, too. Is that going on? Yeah. Yeah. So I started working for a company called Renegade, uh, Renegade GK. They reached out to me. And to be honest, that was a real reason why I kind of got back into back into soccer because I started looking at goalies <laughs> and I was like <laughs> oh I miss it oh I miss it you know but yeah so we're doing work with them they're trying to trying to branch out a little bit and it's it's been fun you know it's been fun getting back into the goalkeeper world and you know that's part of the reason why I reached out because I was like oh I wonder how how these guys are doing and you know I kind of want to tap back in so no I appreciate you I appreciate you giving that a shout and yeah it's a good company good people and you know we're just trying to build I mean, I think one of the a really cool thing that you could do potentially like on just on the union platform is you could just start doing like a vlog of kind of like your journey of like getting back into coaching and like what that's all yeah, about. Yeah. And like, 
Yeah. You know, and you can even juxtapose that with the broadcasting, you know, and just kind of share your personal experiences every day and then ask people, you know, their advice or, you know, what, what they're seeing, what they're not seeing, you know, what, what they did, what they didn't do. I think a lot of people would really dig that. We could make that like a, either a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly type, you know, um, uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's a great it's idea. And, and, yeah. And one of the things too, like, that's a great, great shout because, when you do retire, like I have so much on my mind about goalkeeping and just kind of like a lot of reflecting and, and, you know, that's part of the reason why I really love coaching and getting back involved with this goal, with this glove company. It's, I have so much, I have just so much in my mind of goalkeeper and like just reflecting and things and the processes of things that I, I encourage all goalkeepers that have ever played to share your knowledge because it's just, you, you have a wealth of it and you need to pass it down to the next generations because it's a, it's a bit, like I said, it's a very unique position and, you know, I, I empathize and I love the goalkeeper union because it, it is a true it's a true pack of people that only understand each other. <laughs> so what, what's going on next for you? What uh, what 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 are the next things? What are the things you want to plug right now that uh, if anybody's in the Tampa area, for instance, like you've got your academy obviously going on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're in the Tampa Bay area, Tampa Bay Goalkeeper Academy, give us a look. Um, you know, of course, the Renegade Company, we're, we're going to be trying new things. I'm going to be giving some gloves away, things like that. And you know, if uh, if you're into sports, we got the Super Bowl coming up. Smack Apparel. It's a busy uh, it's a busy time for us there. We're making fun. You know, we're making fun uh, sports shirts and things like that. But no, I mean, besides that, man, I appreciate you having me on and you know, giving me the opportunity to have this conversation. Are you doing any goalkeeping apparel uh, for Smack? No, we're not. The first we're we're I'm slowly getting us into soccer stuff. So it's a very football okay. family. It's a very football. You know, but you know, they're open to they're open to soccer. They're open to different things and. Maybe we'll make our way to MLS right now. It's some European teams with the funny lead shirt. We made a, uh, I, my, my lightest idea was just a, the silhouette of a goat in a number 10 Jersey. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, emphasizing Messi winning the world cup, things like that. So just fun gear and nothing goalkeeper though. Not yet. Have you thought about a, 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 a shirt that says a second annual Tom Brady retirement announcement? Uh, don't be so mean. It's sad <laughs> down here. We're hurting down here. That was a, that was a tough year. It's a tough year yeah. down here. Tough year, you made the playoffs, but we weren't good. <laughs> I know, I know. You just happened to be in a shockingly bad division. It was a long, so it was a, it was a season where you knew the end was coming, and then you make the playoffs, so you get that like, oh, we have hope, and then the hopes just come crashing down, and we're back to being bucks. So unfortunately, no, we're back. no, 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 no. I mean, dude, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you guys will get a, a Jimmy G or a Derek Carr or something. <laughs> something along those type of type of lines that left, which I left appreciate is, uh, the optimism. I appreciate the optimism. I mean, look, I mean, you know, look, Hey, you had a good run. You had a good run, uh, three years in the playoffs as a Bucks fan. That's pretty good. We won a Super Bowl. You won it a was Super an Bowl. insane run. It was an insane run. It was something that, you know, you got to pinch yourself if you're a Bucks fan. And, you know, 10 years from now, when, when things aren't looking so great, we're going to be like, I cannot believe that even happened. <laughs> yeah. And what's, what's, what's on, what's on the, what's on the agenda with the Rowdies? You're, you're doing games this year? No, I mean, I hope so. I hope, you know, it's funny the way that they do broadcasting. It's set up, um, you know, you just kind of get, you get assigned to games and it's all out of a central location, the way that they do the broadcasting for the USL. But, you know, I would love to get involved with the Rowdies. I'm actively always, you know, speaking with them and, and trying to find fun things to do because, you know, what they're doing here is great. And they have one of the most beautiful stadiums in the entire country. And I stand by that. And if you've never, if you've never had the chance to come check out St. Pete for a soccer game right on the water, I highly recommend you do it because it is quite the scene. Dude, I love it. I love it when like the USL like Pacific Conference teams like have to go out for like some random some random game against Tampa Bay in like July. It's like, well, we're <laughs> yeah. on, we're on the road in uh we're on the road in San Diego uh you know in a couple of days and then we go to Tampa uh to just get punched with just, the humidity. <laughs> <laughs> one game, one game, and then right back on the plane to play in Arizona. Like it's like it's crazy. Uh, sometimes the USL schedule. But uh, um, if people want to reach out to you directly, Jeff, maybe uh, maybe some people out there uh, listening uh, in the USL world want you to do some games for them too. Who never, you never know. Uh, where's the best place for them to connect with you? Yeah, I mean, like I'm very active on social. I enjoy the I enjoy the fun sides of social media and trying to be funny on social media. So really, just at at Jeff underscore at Nella one pretty much Instagram or Twitter, I'm always reachable. And, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always available online pretty much. So if anyone wants to reach out to me for any reason, or, you know, learn a little bit more about the things I got going on, I'd love to connect with anybody in the goalie union, or even if you just want to pick my brain for anything, or, you know, learn about my experiences. I'm, I'm a very open book. 
Yeah. And guys, if obviously you want to reach out to us, it's contact at inside the 18 media.com. If you have a guest suggestion or a topic suggestion or at goalkeeper podcast on the union app uh, is the best place to reach out. We get flooded on Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. So really the union app is the best place to do it. Uh, again, a better place for you to connect with people that actually uh, are your target audience, are the people that you want to talk to, uh, as opposed to you post, you spending all this time editing your session design and you posting it online. And, you know, a mom in Tennessee that likes cats, you know, saw it because you happened to uh, post, you know, wildcat uh, in your, in, in your, in your, in your session design. And so the algorithm thinks this is about wildcats. So they see it. Uh, and then all the, all the players that you really wanted to have, see it, uh, didn't get to see it. So there's a place, better place to go. It's fully free. Check it out online. Uh, obviously at Saskia Weber on, uh, the union as well too, or at pro GK Academy. That is all the time on inside the 18 and we are out later guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.